Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, we've got David Katz up next. Uh, David is founder and former director of the Yale Griffin Prevention Research Centre, amongst many other things, um, on the front line during um, some of COVID. His presentation is uh, titled Spanish Flu to Spanish Inquisition, uh, the Pandemic Policy in the Time of Social Media. Um, and that's certainly, this is going to be a fascinating discussion because one of the uh, most corrupting uh, elements and, and escalating elements of this period uh, has been social media. David, you with us there? I am with you, Mark, and good to be with you. Good to be with everyone. And, you know, it, it's interesting to note that uh, we've lived multiple lifetimes since we last convened just some number of months ago. And I think that's, it's an important framework to these discussions. And, and I hasten to note, uh, hearing some of Sunetra's comments, but just noting the roster of speakers you have, what a privilege and honor it is to join ranks with people who don't just bring to this conversation expertise, but clear-minded thinking. Expertise is somewhat rarefied, the ability to think clearly honestly to avoid dogma, diatribe, renounce drama, and stay close to the data and really honor fundamental principles of, of good epidemiology, that's very rarefied. And uh, you know, it's extremely well represented uh, among the speakers here. So privileged to, to join ranks with them and, and address this issue of Spanish flu to Spanish Inquisition, uh, which uh, our friends at Monty Python tell us uh, nobody ever expects, but maybe sh we should be doing exactly that at this point. Um, but I, I do hasten to note that when we last convened and we were talking about policy responses in New Zealand, we didn't have vaccines. And, and by the way, it's interesting also to note that I'm already seeing some vaccine opposition in the, in the chat function, the Q&A, and I'm not in that camp, and I think most of us in a fairly centrist place looking at all of the options uh, are proponents of vaccines. What we're simply looking for is that vaccines confer decisive net benefit, and we can come back to that issue. Uh, but what, what is clear, okay, looks like I can start my video and get the rewards of having combed my hair, so there we go. Here I am, folks, nice to see you. Um, when we last discussed policy in New Zealand, it was a case of lockdown on an indefinite timeline. Pretty different situation now. My understanding is that New Zealand has suffered a total of 25 deaths to COVID uh, for a mortality per million uh, of about five per million, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, it's also my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong once we started the dialogue, is that that, that internally the country is not locked down, that, that pretty much uh, things are all opened up and probably doing better than, than many nations around the world. Yeah, the that's, right. that's right, David, we, we are. Yeah, which is great. The particular problem at the moment though is not locked down, but pretty much locked in. In other words, Kiwis <laughs> need to stay home and nobody else is invited. And get in. That's right. And yeah, and, and so now, you know, you're totally dependent on vaccines to fix that. And, and that may be less of a problem now that there are multiple vaccines more coming and presumably the vaccine supply will get better soon. When we last discussed that issue, it was on an indefinite timeline. We didn't know when there would be vaccines, if there would be vaccines. So one of the fundamental problems with this as policy, even if it winds up working in an idiosyncratic case because the vaccines came very quickly is, in effect, it's a case of deus ex machina, right? You, you, you need the intercession from the outside. Uh, the, the vaccine was not homegrown. New Zealand didn't generate the solution, but basically was hoping somebody somewhere in the world would produce a rescue. And whenever we can avoid being that helpless, that dependent on an outside remedy, it's better policy. So this may in fact work out well ultimately for New Zealand when we're looking back at which countries fared well during the pandemic. New Zealand may be a standout and, and I hope so. I think that's terrific, but there's an element of good luck because the remedy came from without. Again, deus ex machina, generally not the, the best of policies. So just by way of reminder, uh, a lot of what we talked about last time I think is relevant again now, even though the context has changed my particular advocacy from very early on, uh, easily a year ago, even a bit more, uh, 
was that you really do need to look in both directions before crossing a busy pandemic. Uh, rather like crossing a, a busy street, there, there are potential <laughs> harms coming at you from more than one direction, and you really ought to have a good look at both. And, and specifically with regard to the pandemic, the, the two directions I, I think are fairly obvious to us all now. One, of course, is infection with SARS-CoV-2 and the harms that can do. And the other is the radical disruption of the social determinants of health, loss of livelihoods, being locked in isolation, desperation, destitution, food insecurity, hunger, frustration, domestic violence, child abuse, opioid use, alcoholism, suicides. And ultimately, when you sum it all up, the transformation of what we routinely refer to as the social determinants of health into, as shown on this slide, an article from Health Affairs, the social determinants of death. And I worried throughout uh, the magnitude of this was potentially quite staggering. I, I was privileged, Mark, some months back, I think it may have been after our last symposium, I don't recall, to do a webinar addressing COVID-related issues at UC Berkeley. And I, I was joined on that panel by an economist from Stanford, Nick Bloom. And so I, I credit this slide and these insights to Nick. I, I, I'm not an economist. And so, you know, everything I know as an amateur, <laughs> I've learned from experts like Nick. He presented these data and, and essentially what they indicate is that for every person who loses their livelihood for an extended period of time at or near midlife, the cost in life expectancy is a year to a year and a half. And so back then, I, I did the math, it's changed since, but if we use numbers from the United States to make a direct comparison, because I, I don't know the total magnitude of job losses in New Zealand, and I, whenever uh, doing international presentations, I, I apologize for the, the ignorance about the, the differing epidemiology around the world. We're all in this together. There are a lot of similarities, but country-specific data are country-specific. So just looking at, at my home and, and providing a, a window to this issue, uh, we've had over 400,000 deaths in the U.S. to COVID, uh, over 450,000 now. And the official estimates are that for every life lost, it, it's taken about 10 years of life expectancy. Personally, I, I, based on what I've seen, including on the front lines, I think that estimate is excessive. But even if we apply that and we do that math, 450,000 times 10, that's 4.5 million years of human life lost. And that's a terrible toll. And my heartfelt condolences to everybody who's been affected by that, of course. But we have lost 50 million jobs and there have been estimates that easily 20 million of those job losses in the US are long-term. And so if we do that math 20 million times a year and a half each time, that's 30 million years of human life loss. So not quite 10 times as bad as the toll of the virus, but almost, almost a, an order of magnitude worse. And, and the important issue here, and this was always the important issue, I'm a public health physician, I am not an economist. This is not talking about an exchange between lives and dollars. This is lives and lives. You just can't unbundle livelihoods from lives. It's absolutely critical for people to have a way of making a living. Um, the, the financial security, the food security, those issues are critical, but there are very important psychological effects as well. And so we were failing to look both ways throughout the world. Uh, I think New Zealand did, I think the US did. And, and I, I think what's interesting now is, is to start to explore some of the reasons why. The other thing that happened pretty early on is flatten the curve became a global meme. And there's a gravitational force attached to memes that they, they, they pull you in and you, you either join that camp or you renounce it and go the other way. Uh, so, you know, essentially joining the meme camp is an action. And for every action, as Sir Isaac told us, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's pretty much what we wound up with. But the, the clamor to just flatten the curve was always misguided. And I, I showed this commentary from uh, Maria Chikina at the University of Pittsburgh, West Pegden at Carnegie Mellon University last time, they went into one of the prominent models that were used to justify flattening the curve. And they just turned it back on and said, what happens if you ever stop? What happens if you ever release the clamps? And they actually used a model that was published in a very prominent op-ed in the New York Times. And what was shown in the Times is at the top of this slide, 
And uh, Chikina and Pegden went back into that very same model. They didn't develop anything new. They just turned it back on and said, what happens if the world continues after October 1? What happens if dates keep coming? <laughs> and what happens is all of the casualties of COVID that you thought you had prevented just happen on a different day. So a just flatten the curve approach really means you hunker in your bunker indefinitely and wait for deus ex machina. Now, if it happens to come along in the guise of highly effective vaccines, for instance, this strategy could work. So you keep basically the, the clamps in place until there's an external remedy. But otherwise, this is a pretty dire policy unless there's something to follow it. You could do this for a little while to avoid overwhelming hospitals to defer the casualty count, but then what comes next? There has to be something that comes next. Sadly, what did come next after the clamor for flattening the curve was the Spanish Inquisition. And, and what I mean by this, and of course, you know, it's, it's a juxtaposition of terms that makes it cute, Spanish flu, Spanish Inquisition, but the Spanish Inquisition was an assault on thought. You weren't allowed to think other than the sanctioned way. And quite frankly, I, I think that has been one of the great scourges of the COVID pandemic. It, it's the first major pandemic in the internet age, in the age of social media. And so what wound up happening is that not just news traveled quickly, but news about news, opinion about news, opinion about opinion about news, and opinion about opinion about opinion. And frankly, all of that went viral faster than SARS-CoV-2. Mark Twain famously said that a lie will travel the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. And however true that was back in Twain's day, it's vastly truer in the age of internet discourse and, and social media. So misinformation was rampant. And even when the information wasn't overtly wrong, there was a vested interest on the part of mainstream media to extract every possible dollop of drama from the pandemic. Now, a pandemic is pretty dramatic to begin with. You could just report the facts and help people understand. And from my point of view, that's ample drama, but that's not how the media run with this sort of thing. If it bleeds, it leads, comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable. And frankly, that too was part of the modern Spanish inquisition. We got our data shrouded in drama. So, you know, anytime there was speculation that maybe immunity doesn't last and, and you know, maybe um, everybody's going to have long-term complications, whether they have symptoms or not, or maybe, maybe, maybe vast amounts of speculation uninformed by data. And those always generated headlines because it's provocative. And so whether it was misinformation in social media or drama in mainstream media, there was a foreclosure of balanced judicious thinking about this whole situation. And I would argue that was one of the great tragedies. And the result of that was bitemporal hemianopsia. My, my fellow clinicians will know exactly what that means. Anybody else listening in who's not an MD, probably not. This is an MRI of the optic chiasm. This is the place in the brain that those are eyeballs at the, at the top of the slide, just to orient you. So this is the place where nerve fibers from both eyeballs cross on their way into the brain. And a fairly common benign tumor uh, called a pituitary adenoma puts pressure right on this X where these fibers cross and it creates blindness out to either side. And I would argue that's what we wound up with because of the pressures of social media, because of the kind of rabid responses that Sunetra and, and, and Jay experienced when um, publishing the Great Barrington Declaration and arguing for focus protection, you know, basically, uh, and, and Martin, um, you know, at any time there was a well-reasoned argument that didn't happen to align with the orthodoxy, uh, you know, people just refused to see the merit in it. So we had blindness in both directions, out to either side, which is bitemporal hemianopsia. You know, one group basically arguing we've got to lock everything down, hunker in our bunkers and, you know, and wait till everybody can be vaccinated and nothing else is acceptable. Don't want to hear any counter arguments. Don't want to hear that this is not a dangerous disease for everyone. Don't want to hear that the sky isn't falling. And, you know, essentially an extreme moral sanctimony, but from the other side, and, and you know, we need to acknowledge the faults in both directions, 
you know, here in the US, we had a liberate my state movement. And that was corrupted by arguments that this whole thing is a hoax. The virus isn't real. There isn't a virus. This is the government playing with our minds. This is Bill Gates trying to practice global mind control. The absolute absurd, preposterous nonsense. None of us on this panel believe any of that nonsense. So, you know, being in the middle means actually you're willing to look at the merits and demerits out to either side. It's the very opposite of bitemporal hemianopsia. I think the Spanish Inquisition of this particular pandemic talked the world into bitemporal hemianopsia, blind spots out to either side. Everybody was only willing to hear the opinion they already happened to own. That's a bad basis for effective public policy. That's where we were. And so we didn't get effective public policy. We got a train wreck. Uh, you know, I, I would argue again that in, in the fullness of time, if New Zealand is judged to have done very well, it, it's partly because it's an island nation and it had opportunities that, that other countries never had, and partly because the vaccines came along in record time. And if they're well distributed and evoke good responses and New Zealand can open back up to the world and very few people got hurt, that will be terrific. But it's not really because of enlightened policy. There was much more that could have been done and in my view should have been done. In the US and in many parts of the world, the judgment of history will be far harsher because you know, essentially we argued against herd immunity and Sunetra was talking about herd immunity just a little while ago. We converted, and again, this is the effect of the Spanish Inquisition, we, we converted and corrupted any discussion of herd immunity into heresy. Now, the idea was now if you talk about herd immunity, you are a genocidal lunatic. I mean, that, that's just preposterous. All pandemics end with herd immunity. The only question is, what is the safest, most expeditious way to get there from here? Is it by means of natural infection? So people who can actually get the infection and not suffer any significant harm, and they develop immunity, and they are protected, and they protect others, and that's how a pandemic ends? Historically, that's often been the case. Or is it by means of vaccines? because they're available and they're safer than the infection or is it a combination of the two, but all pandemics end with herd immunity one way or another. We turned that into heresy. And yet in the United States, we're well on our way to herd immunity. We've had, and we, we've documented uh, 25 million or so infections. That's, a, that's an egregious underestimate. It, it's five to 10 times more than that. So it, it may very well be that 250 million people in this country have already had this infection. And consequently, we are most of the way to population level herd immunity, just not on purpose and before the vaccines ever make a significant impact. By the way, I, it, it's probably only right to, to note, I am recovering from COVID right now. Uh, five people were in my household over the holidays. Three of our adult children were home. Uh, everybody had made it this far through the pandemic uh, without encountering the bug. Surprisingly, again, I, I did a stint on the front lines, didn't get it then. Um, thought I had it a year ago, but tested negative. This time, there's no doubt about it. Everybody else in the household got tested and tested positive. We all had the same symptoms, complete loss of olfaction. And I'm a little more than two weeks out. I still don't feel great. Uh, nothing terrible, nothing serious, exactly as I would have predicted. Now, I'm 58 years old, but I'm in excellent health because I practice what I preach in preventive medicine. So I experienced it the way a younger person would, but our kids really breeze through. So they're in their early mid twenties um, to early thirties. They all did extremely well. My wife and I, you know, pretty darn sick. Uh, I was in bed for several days, which is unheard of for me. So, you know, frankly, it's not a lot of fun. And, you know, the vaccine may be a better option uh, when it's available. But on the other hand, I am an example of how poorly we have controlled the flow of the virus through the population. We're on our way to herd immunity. We just didn't do it by design. We didn't manage the pandemic. The pandemic managed us. And, you know, again, different nations had different experiences, but you see very little evidence anywhere of policy informed by a willingness to look in both directions, consider the harms of infection and the harms of lockdown, to look for a balanced approach that minimizes all of those harms. And where we, the people, are actually in charge of our destiny rather than simply hoping we get through this and all will be well. 
So fundamentally, uh, I, I, I'm always inclined to invoke the parable of the blind men and the elephant. That's what we were. Everybody took hold of a different part of the pandemic, mistook it for the whole, and argued accordingly. And we were more or less entirely unwilling to listen to one another. That's usually the case when dogma is barking. We, we can't hear one another. That's pretty much how it's been. Uh, a colleague recently reminded me, this is a column I wrote, and if you look at the date here, March 13th of last year, so very close to a full year ago, uh, decisive action was, was what I was arguing for based on the extreme concentrations of bad COVID outcomes in the elderly and people with a significant burden of chronic disease. And decisive stands for directing crisis intervention services to the especially vulnerable. In other words, focus protection. So again, a, a nod to Martin, Jay, and Sunetra, and, and, and the, the, the brave stance of the Great Barrington Declaration. You know, I, I, I wasn't heard around the world quite the way they were, uh, but I said exactly the same thing a uh, better part of a year prior. Decisive was focus protection. And, and actually in this column, which I commend to you, so those of you interested, you know, again, uh, it, it's sort of a, a window to historical thinking at this point, but have a look. I lay out in great detail um, the very argument for focus protection, concentrating resources on protecting those who are very vulnerable to becoming casualties of SARS-CoV-2. The, the, the issue never should have been case counts. Uh, you know, the, the number of cases is not really the critical consideration. It's the number of casualties. Again, uh, New Zealand, I'm glad, has a very tiny number of casualties. So we could argue, uh, you know, whether the policy was enlightened or otherwise, the outcome is good. In the United States, we've had both high case counts and a high casualty count. We've done a horrible job. But you want to prevent casualties. Well, there are two ways to do that. Keep everybody in the virus apart or keep those vulnerable to becoming casualties away from the virus and don't worry quite so much about everybody else. And there are all sorts of nuanced public policy responses that would have allowed for that. It's too late now. Uh, although it's not, too, we, we do still have some options. I'll come to those momentarily. Um, but you know, most of the opportunity for applying focus protection came and went, sorry, I didn't mean to go backwards. Um, some number of months ago. And, and you know, we can discuss whether or not there was some pivotal moment along the way. I also want to note, and again, this is a, a nod back to my title, Spanish Flu and Spanish Inquisition, that, that part of the inquisitional component of this was you're only allowed to make certain comparisons. The, the morality police basically told us it is not acceptable to compare this pandemic to seasonal flu because this is so much worse, the sky is clearly falling, that's invalid. If you wanna compare it to something, compare it to the great pandemic of 1918, that's the only valid comparison. And, and you know, this is an odd situation for me to find myself in because you know, frankly, I'm, as a public health physician, I'm pretty progressive. I, I'm on what we refer to, at least in this part of the world as you know, left of center politically. So it, it's my usual camp that kind of turned on me and said, no, you, you know, if you're comparing this to seasonal flu, once again, you're, you're a genocidal lunatic. It, it was the response of the Spanish Inquisition. But I lay out here some numbers for you. So each year on average, just plain old influenza kills a little fewer than 400,000 people. The estimate's 389,000. Now let's be clear, that's a garden variety flu year. It can be much, much worse than that. We've had 2.4 million deaths around the world. This is the bottom bullet from SARS-CoV-2 so far. So, okay, it's six times worse than a garden variety flu year and maybe only you know, twice as bad as a really bad flu year. All right, so you could say, well, because it's six times worse, you can't compare it to flu. Well, wait a minute, but you just told me it's fine to compare it to the great pandemic of 1918. That killed 50 million people. That's already 25 times worse than the global toll of COVID. But let's not stop there. Let's remember that in 1918, the global population was 1.8 billion. It's 7.8 billion today. So we have to adjust that. So 50 million deaths out of 1.8 billion is a death for every 36 people. Uh, whereas COVID has killed fewer than one in 3,600 people it's less than one one hundredth as bad as the great pandemic. Now, I, again, I, I'm not arguing that this is just like flu. 
but I am pointing out it's actually more like seasonal flu than it is like the great pandemic of 1918. And it, it was an overlay of moral posturing that told us which comparisons and which contrasting data we were allowed to talk about and which we weren't. And once again, this was a foreclosure of thought. And it's really hard to navigate through complexities of a public health crisis if you're not allowed to think. And effectively, that's what we did to one another. So six times worse than an average flu year, one one hundredth as bad as the great pandemic of 1918, which leads me to the stance that, that I've defended regarding public policy from the start, uh, I, I argued that our goal should be total harm minimization. There was more than one way for the situation to hurt people, Americans, Kiwis, everybody, everywhere. It could hurt them by infecting them. It could hurt them because we have haphazard, one size fits all unthoughtful public policy responses, which then reverberate through the social determinants of health. We should consider both of those as important lives matter, livelihoods matter, any which way the situation hurts someone bad, any which way we protect someone good, we should aim for total harm minimization. And I argued then and still feel now the right way to do that is with vertical interdiction or risk stratified approaches or focus protection. Concentrate protection on the populations most likely to become casualties, liberalize the protections for those least likely to become casualties, and then always do good epidemiology. So for example, you know, if, if we let populations out into the world because they're at low risk, we always need to monitor very carefully to see where we right. Sometimes you know, what you do based on the data you have proves to be wrong when you gather more data. Data gathering and judging ourselves based on valid epidemiology are always critical. I also thought hierarchical responsibility was important. I'll come to that in a second. Um, sharing the responsibility to mitigate risk between institutions and individuals. And then a, a singular blind spot, and this remains the case, and I, I don't think New Zealand's done better than anybody else here, uh, is that this has been a teachable moment for health promotion, and we've largely neglected that. This notion of hierarchical responsibility, to borrow from uh, President Kennedy, uh, I think we should have been asking both what our countries can do for us and what we can do for ourselves and our countries and one another. In other words, Public policy needed to manage some of this. Institutional responses needed to manage some of this, but individuals needed to be empowered to understand their personal risk, the risk of loved ones, the risk of your household, and what practices were required to protect you appropriately. And they didn't need to be one size fits all. I think if we had informed people, we're not all at the same risk. And so we have different opportunities to manage our risk that would have made a huge difference psychologically, as well as in many other ways. And it, it's tempting to invoke the, the, um, the famous ideology of Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Uh, well, you know, giving people the capacity to manage their own risk is a why, and it would have made the how of pandemic living a bit easier to bear. People would have felt empowered. COVID has proven to be a case study in learned helplessness, which the psychology literature tells us is probably the single greatest blight we can suffer. It's the surest path to depression, addiction, suicide, all the horrible things that we have seen spike as a result of the pandemic and our response to it. And the antidote to helplessness is to empower people and their tools to do that. I, I have friends at a company called Everest Health who've developed a very elegant, personalized COVID age risk calculator or CARC. And the way this tool works is you enter in whatever information you know about your health, your age, your height, your weight, and whether or not you know your blood pressure, whether or not you know your glycohemoglobin. And you watch these numbers at the bottom, you can see in green, adjust in real time. What is the percent likelihood of you, not just anybody, not on average, but you being hospitalized if you get COVID? What's the likelihood of you winding up in the ICU or dying? And it also shows you how you could change that risk by altering your risk factors. What if I gave up smoking? What if I lost some weight? What if I improved my glycohemoglobin or lowered my blood pressure? This opportunity to empower people with information about individual risk and then to invite people to manage that risk, be, be involved in managing that risk, huge missed opportunity of the pandemic. The other thing, of course, at this stage of the game this tool can and is being used 
to allocate scarce resources, notably the vaccine, so that those who are most vulnerable to bad infection outcomes are first in line. And, and with a tool like this, you can be much more refined than just everybody over 65. Within age categories, you can stratify based on the variations in risk. And I, I think that's very useful. So, you know, again, the simple steps that I think could have prevailed, should have prevailed, risk stratify the population, match policy guidelines to level of risk, and then in particular, um, take advantage of this opportunity, people's acute concerns about COVID to say, hey, you know what, these many cardiometabolic risk factors that were bad news for us before, they're an acute threat now, let's fix them. We have an acute reason to fix them. And then, of course, everything we already know, masking, distancing, sanitizing, sheltering for those uh, who need to, and of course, now the advent of the vaccines. So originally, you know, when I, I didn't have access to a COVID age risk calculator, um, I just put this in a color coded grid. But as a lifestyle medicine, preventive medicine specialist, it's the white arrows that are most important to me. What they represent is the opportunity for people in higher risk tiers because of age and health to migrate to lower risk tiers because the health factors are modifiable. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity in New Zealand. It's an opportunity in the US. It's an opportunity at the level of businesses, communities, families. We all can play a role in mitigating our risk for bad COVID outcomes as we get through the remainder of the pandemic and do it in a way that becomes a gift that keeps on giving because the benefits of vitality do not stop when the pandemic comes to an end. Colleagues and I uh, published this preprint. Uh, we had a couple papers in the Journal of Emerging Infectious Disease throughout the uh, pandemic on the massive contribution of cardiometabolic risk factors to COVID risk. But we also looked at what happens if, if we fix the fixable stuff. And our estimate was that we could reduce hospitalization here in the US where it's been a massive burden by as much as 40%. So almost half the total hospitalization could have been eliminated if we had just done a more diligent job of modifying readily modifiable cardiometabolic risk factors, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary disease, type two diabetes, insulin resistance, stuff we know how to fix with diet and lifestyle. So, you know, those months ago, Mark, I, I said, you know, th this is a perfect time for a let's all get healthy now campaign. Um, that remains true. A lot's changed. You know, again, months in a pandemic is, is lifetimes, but this opportunity is still with us. And as best I know, uh, still neglected around the world. In terms of what we can do now to get through the remainder, it varies by country. So, you know, again, we've got huge problems here in the US managing the pandemic. Different situation in New Zealand. I would have fussed more before, you know, about uh, no country being an island and you really don't want to have your people locked in and everybody else locked out because we had no idea when the vaccines were coming. You know, at this point, I think it's pretty clear that the policy in New Zealand is okay, we made it this far through, the vaccines are available, we're going to keep hunkering in place until we can immunize everybody in the safest way possible. I have no real argument with that. But again, in retrospect, we will look at this pandemic as a case study in the foreclosure of thinking because of the pernicious influence of the internet, social media, the dramatization of epidemiologic data. We can, and I hope if ever we have to play this game again, will do far, far better. Thank you, David. Uh, great stuff. Um, but to cover there and some questions uh, which have been coming in as you've been speaking. Uh, so I'll just run through a few of them if that's if you've got some time. Sure. Um, uh, perhaps uh, start with your last uh, towards the end there where you were talking about the reducing of um, I think I think you're talking about comorbidities and reducing them. So you, we could have reduced um, uh, hospitalization by 40%. Was that was that um, so that meant if we had uh, reduce those comorbidities previously. There weren't, there's nothing we could have done about that now. No, actually, uh, you know, it's a great question, Mark. You know, again, it, just so people know, I'm an internist and uh, board certified in preventive medicine. My career has been focused on this very issue for 30 years, uh, eliminating preventable premature death and chronic disease. And while this is a long-term play, you know, the longer you adhere to a healthy diet, physical activity, avoidance of toxins like tobacco, excess alcohol, all that stuff, and, you know, the, the, the formula, the longer you adhere to that, the greater the accrual of benefit. But it actually begins almost immediately. And, and we have a couple of lines of inquiry that demonstrate this best. One is endothelial function testing. 
So again, some folks will, will be familiar with this measure, some not. Uh, it's a measure of vascular function uh, routinely captured using ultrasound. We did this in my lab at Yale for, for many years, uh, published a number of papers. Well, endothelial function is, is a critical expression of overall vascular health. And the evidence is very clear that it changes with a single meal. You eat one high quality meal versus one junk meal. You, you do a randomized crossover trial and you test people postprandially. You see massive differences in their basic vascular biology following a single meal. And you can see that throughout a day if you shift the quality of diet. So that's immediate, that's an immediate effect. And the same with exercise. You study people after a walk versus the same period of time spent on the couch and you see a change in their vascular function. So that, that's one line of inquiry that tells us the modification of risk factors for bad COVID outcomes. And, and by the way, COVID is known to compromise endothelial function. It, it is among other things, a vascular disease. So we have that line of inquiry saying, you know, potential remediation of vulnerability to bad COVID outcomes with a single meal, a single walk, and sure, those benefits will grow over time, but you can start to experience them immediately. The other line of inquiry, Mark, is chemotaxis. These are cell culture studies where essentially you harvest people's white blood cells, and then you provoke them with an antigen and you see the vigor of their response and exactly the same findings. So if you harvest white blood cells from people who've had a junk food meal, and you provoke them, they're sluggish. If you harvest the same white blood cells from people following a high quality meal, those very same cells in response to the very same provocation are much more vigorous. Ditto exercise versus a stint on the couch. So, so these fundamental elements of lifestyle as medicine begin exerting an influence, certainly within hours, arguably within minutes. And then yes, it does accrue over time. So I think it's not too late, even now, for this to start to change COVID outcomes around the world. But certainly, you know, all these months that have gone by without there being a concerted national, international focus on, you know, the massive burden of chronic disease and how much it is contributing to the COVID mortality. In the US, again, where we have suffered a massive toll from this pandemic, there's no arguing that. We yeah. could have cut it just about in half simply by meticulous protection of nursing homes. We could have cut it just about in half by systematically working to modify cardiometabolic risk factor. I mean, we had many, many opportunities that didn't require locking down the country to massively reduce the, the total burden of this. But again, it just wasn't part of the dialogue. We, we, never, we, we were never thinking together to come up with those solutions that weren't either lock it all down or liberate my state. And you know, again, that was the toll of this blinkered thinking uh, on a topic that required nuance. Mm. Uh, just to comment on that, um, the, the governments did even worse, really, in that they stopped people going out here in the harbour in Wellington. The, there was a police launch uh, out there to stop people going uh, fishing and kayaking, which is one of the things I like doing, uh, during our lockdown. I mean, right, and right. In the UK, they, they had dr police drones up watching people who were going for a run too far from home. Uh, so all of these yeah, things, and, uh, and, and yeah, and so you know you understand the intention, but how misguided in practice, yeah. and you know what is the evidence that anybody jogging caught COVID that way or transmitted it to anybody else? So absolutely zero. It, you know it, it's vanishingly implausible unless you're running in a dense crowd. You know, it's, it, I can understand not sanctioning a marathon, the New York City Marathon. My daughter right. ran it a year ago, it was canceled, you know, during COVID. That makes sense because it's thousands of people packed together, breathing hard. Okay, don't do that. That's a super spreader event. But one person running on their own, hmm. not a shred of evidence that there's any risk of transmission. Yeah, so again, we, we routinely around the world tossed out the baby with the bathwater. Um, you, I'd love to ask how you think we could stop making a drama out of a health crisis. Uh, and you described um, about how media was so focused on, you know, getting the worst of every piece of news. And, and a, a, just a, re a recent case in point, it was almost like the start of the, um, the virus um, epidemic uh, in, um, in, in miniature was when the UK decided that they'd had, they'd had some new strains. Right. And uh, Boris Johnson said, well, you know, that's se it's 70% uh, more transmissible and so 30% uh, more deadly. Uh, that turns out subsequently that number was perhaps less than 50% certain and, and 
and, and actually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the time you said it, they weren't even they weren't even fifty percent certain that it was true. And, and yet it, it it made headlines because it was dramatic. Yes. That's so how the, it. That's the how media it was. didn't say didn't interrogate it at all. They just went right. straight to headlines. But the politicians knew that. They um and uh, and and we're finding finding out now that. In Germany, they, um, the health departments were discussing what worst numbers could they use to get the population to be frightened so they would take action. So how, how they, even the politicians, seem to think that the drama is required to put us all in a position of learned helplessness. I mean, how do we have an intelligent discussion if the politicians and the media don't think we're capable of doing it? Yeah, well, it does begin, I think, with each of us. And, and let's be clear. If we want reasonable, thoughtful, far-ranging dialogue, we have to be active participants in it. Mm -hmm. In other words, we can't immediately dismiss the opinion that we don't already happen to own. The other side may have something worth listening to. We all have to consider that. So I, you know, I think we can each interrogate ourselves and ask, you know, how strong is my confirmation bias? How mm -hmm. likely am I to start nodding my head when I hear what I already believe to be true and nodding my head in the other direction the minute I hear something that I don't happen to like. Because if I do that, essentially I'm inviting my interlocutor to push harder. Yes. And you know, this is what leads to e extremes, right? So you know, we didn't just have lock it all down. We also had injudicious arguments about liberate my state. You know, don't worry about the old people. Don't worry about the sick people. That, that was, that's wrong. That's clearly wrong. There were people who were clearly going to be hurt if they encountered this virus and we needed policies in place to protect them. So we're, we're all in on this and we all have to be part of the remedy. And then, you know, we, we all have to start shopping our choices. So, you know, frankly, when we look for information online, we have to look equally hard for opinions that we happen to favor and evidence underlying opinions that we're inclined to reject and we have to judge them comparably. I think if we start doing this, it will begin to reverberate. So, you know, it, it ultimately it takes a village, but the village is made up of individuals who, you know, start to make similar decisions about culture change. And, and the reason, Mark, I frame it this way is, you know, you put yourself in the shoes of, of politicians and policymakers who are saying, look, we've got a population that, you know, basically is opposing every precaution we're recommending, they're vaccine reticent. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm, I'm noticing even here, we, we have some vaccine opposition. And, you know, so then you think, well, we can't take the risk of saying anything nuanced because if there's any subtlety in what we say, those who are opposed to doing anything we recommend will say, ah, see, they're not sure. You know, they're not sure, so we shouldn't listen to them. So we have to pretend we're more sure than we are. Mm. I, I actually think extreme positions invite extreme positions. Again, the, just invoke Sir Isaac Newton. For every action, an equal and opposite reaction. Well, I think that's true for every opinion. For every opinion, for every position, an equal and opposite counterposition. That is pernicious. And so, you know, again, we need to interrogate ourselves and ask, am I part of the problem? And is there something I can do to try and be part of the solution? Be more thoughtful. Be willing to listen to people I'm not natively inclined to agree with. Maybe they have something worthwhile to say. If a lot of us start doing that, we become the remedy. If our use of social media does not promulgate whatever radical thing we happen to find that points in the direction we like, we actually make sure that it's valid before we share it. We're part of the remedy. And ultimately, politicians are accountable to prevailing themes in our culture. Um, I, you know, I think the radicalization of, of opinion about COVID from politicians was aligned with the prevailing views of the body politic. Yeah. So, I, you know, there are many layers to this solution, and I think some of them will take time. I think there are some political solutions. I, you know, if, if I ran the zoo, uh, I, I think we really ought to have um, a very high level um, perhaps intergovernmental um, program aimed at addressing the distinctions between information and misinformation in the social media age. Maybe there are new forms of education people need uh, in addition to new filters. I'm not a fan of censorship, but clearly our ability to differentiate bogus inflammatory nonsense from valid information in either direction is, is pretty frail at the moment. We need to mature that.
and you know, to some extent, uh, thoughtful people can do that uh, for themselves and their families. But I think we need collective effort in that space as well. But fundamentally, Mark, I, I would say a lot of what we're seeing, and I invite people to consider this, a lot of what we're seeing everywhere we look, us, them, politicians, media, is because this is the first great viral pandemic in the age of viral information. And viral information corrupts information. It just travels too fast. We lose control of the narrative before thoughtful people have an opportunity to be thoughtful. And when the narrative has gone too far in one direction, the thoughtful people look at that and say, hey, I want to be thoughtful, but it's too late to try and oppose the momentum, you know, going way too far one way. I've mm -hmm. got to be a counterweight and go the other way. And I think we've seen a lot of that. So there's, there's a lot of fixing to be done. There certainly is. That has been the uh, greatest era and damage of, of this, uh, this, this period has been the creation of sides and extreme right. sides. Um, so given that, um, how, how can we fix that? You're talking about a teachable moment to, that we learn from what happened. Um, but given the, the sides have been set, um, um, how, how, how can we, and narratives have been set as well. And it's very hard to back, back off a narrative that you've, uh, that you've set here in New Zealand, um, the, the pro-government, uh, uh, let's say the side that's supporting the government uh, has um, thought that lockdowns um, and what they've called going hard and going early has, has been what saved us. Um, <laughs> right. they, they won't be able to think, uh, apparently hasn't managed to save anybody else in, around the world, but apparently it saved us for some unique reason. Now, but yeah, how yeah. do we find what that reason might've been? Because there's, if we're not prepared to uh, interrogate our own narratives. Yes, well, that, again, I, I would argue that's part of the remedy. We have to be willing to do that. But I also think, first of all, we need grownups in charge. You know, it, frankly, the provocations of our administration for the past four years in the U.S. has been a huge part of our problem. So we were actively encouraged to be as divided as we could be. We came into the pandemic primed to disagree with one another about everything. Right. The, the, the prevailing mindset in the U.S., and, and the U.S. is a significant influence on the prevailing political mindset of the world. We were not the only ones with this problem, but, you know, to whatever extent we're, we're a beacon, we were a bad beacon. And, you know, basically saying, no, no, this is the way it works. You pick a camp, you gravitate to an extreme of position, and you hurl projectiles at everybody else. I mean, we were actively encouraged to do that. It's horrible. So, you know, that's now changed. We have a new administration that's very much about mending those fences, and I, I think that's healthy and helpful. The other thing we need at this point, Mark, and it, you know, it's not your friend during a pandemic, is time. Mm -hmm. Again, we last convened just months ago, and I, and I think we agree, it feels like lifetimes. Uh, so time during a pandemic is massively distorted. It's not your friend. You don't wanna wait a long time. Everything you want and need, you want and need right now. But the reality is that to make sense of epidemiology, you need a view from altitude. You need to collect data. You need to analyze data. And that never happens quickly. It, it, in fact, it's happened faster during the pandemic than I've ever seen it happen before. I volunteered in an emergency department in New York City last April. And the clinical protocols while I was there were radically different from a week before. Now, that's how fast clinical thinking was it adapting to the demands of the pandemic? That's unprecedented. So, you know, whether it's, it's discourse on, on policy responses or clinical protocols, um, you know, we've actually been amazingly brisk, but if you really want to understand the overall pattern, you have to get up to altitude and that means distance. And, you know, in the case of making sense of a great public health crisis, distance is measured not in distance, but in time. We all know the expression about 2020 hindsight, right? I mean, that's when you really see something clearly. You get past it, the drama dies down, the anxiety subsides, nobody feels like their life is in immediate danger. You take a deep breath and say, okay, what the hell really happened? So, you know, frankly, at this point, we've mucked up the pandemic almost every which way we could. And some countries fared well, uh, you know, largely not because of, of great policy, but because of happenstance. And some countries fared badly, again, largely because of happenstance. I've seen very little indications of truly enlightened policy anywhere. Um, but at this point, it largely is what it is. And, you know, everybody's pretty much committed to getting through this now by trying to minimize the carnage and, you know, the wait for the cavalry, 
cavalry to arrive with with vaccines, and, and that's that's clearly you know what the the prevailing policy view is. So that's not going to change. That's done. And, and you know whether or not we'll manage to fit into the portfolio some effort at modifying cardiometabolic risk factors, I, I'm hopeful, but I'm not really expecting to see that. Um, I, I keep lobbying for it, <laughs> but I can't tell who's listening. Um, so I think we will sort this out when we do a postmortem, mm -hmm. postmortem on the pandemic response, because everybody will be calmer then. Um, but you know, I don't see it happening before then. We, we, I think it's really helpful, Mark, to start to have the conversation for you to ask that question and for others to listen in. What is it going to take to fix this? Let's start to have that dialogue because, you know, again, I, I think we have a little bit less anxiety now than we did months ago. I mean, if for no other reason than the attenuation of the great unknown, the unknown is always the scariest thing. So, you know, even if a pandemic proves to be really quite bad, when you understand your risk, you're less afraid than when you don't know what that risk is. It's, it's like watching a horror movie. You know, no matter how grim the monster is when you finally see the monster, it's less scary than when you're waiting to see the monster. When the monster is, is you know, veiled in shadow, that's the scariest time. So I think the anxiety level is already trending down. I think as we move through the remainder of the pandemic, it will get lower and lower. Uh, I think having, you know, reasonable grownups in charge of countries will help an awful lot. And we now have one in charge of the U.S. So that's a contribution. And I think calm people will be willing to look back at this and say, okay, now let's really make sense of it and let's apply what we learn to the next. You know, I'm not eager to talk about the next pandemic, but you know, frankly, the very factors that led to this one until we fix them make us vulnerable to the next. And I, I sure hope we'll do better next time. So I, I'm reasonably hopeful about this process. I just don't see it happening quickly. I, I think we will get to 2020 vision only in hindsight, and hindsight only comes with time and distance. All right, just one more question. Um, uh, do you think that the, the vaccine, um, the, well, it's probably two two part question. It seems as if part of what you've just been describing, uh, that this history of this year and people taking sides and, and blind spots and the rest of it has made it very difficult to see vaccines accurately or their application or use. Do you think, though, that they are they do have a role in your risk based strategy? And yeah. how, how would that work? Yeah, for sure. I mean, really, my, my big my biggest concern about vaccines is we wouldn't get them in time to do us any good. And, and by the way, in the U.S., that's pretty much where we are. Right. So we are distributing the vaccine, but only after 250 million of us have already been infected and over uh, uh, 450,000 have died. And, you know, so, uh, you know, we're going to be a very long way toward herd immunity accidentally in the United States before the vaccines can bail us out. So that, you know, that was my biggest concern. Look, to be clear, and, and you know, I presume that I'm speaking to many people who recognize immunization and vaccines as, as one of the great advances in public health. It's the reason we're not subject to polio. It's the reason we're not subject to smallpox, but they're not a panacea. They don't need to be a panacea. Everything in medicine involves risk. Every medication to modify a risk factor, every surgical procedure. The reason to do a medical thing is because the risks of doing that thing are less than the risks of not doing that thing. The reason to do a medical thing, any medical thing, is because the risks are less than the benefit. And clearly for many people, that's true. The, whatever we ultimately learn about you know, how safe these vaccines were in the grand scheme of things, it's already quite obvious that they're safer than SARS-CoV-2 for many people, the people at high risk of bad outcomes. Uh, sure, there are allergic reactions to the vaccines. The vaccine is not a panacea. Sure, there are isolated cases of thrombocytopenia. The vaccine is not a panacea. Everything in medicine involves risk. And, and frankly, you know, let, let's be more bracingly honest with one another. Everything in life involves risk. Crossing the street involves risk. You look both ways, you decide if you need to be on the other side and you take your chances. But people get hit by cars. Everything in life involves risk. We're always doing risk benefit calculations. So we should expect no different for vaccines. There is risk involved. They are a proper remedy though when they represent a path to immunity that involves considerably less risk and more benefit than exposure to the bug. Now, you could argue that, that maybe for 
children where we have a vast amount of data on you know, how impervious they are to the ill effects of SARS-CoV-2 for the most part, and we don't really know about the effects of the vaccine, that you know, maybe it's safer to, to let kids be exposed to the virus and not to vaccinate them. On the other hand, nursing home residents, it's clearly not safe to expose them to SARS-CoV-2, and the vaccines could be really quite bad, which they don't appear to be, but they could be really quite bad and still be far better than exposure to the bug in that population. So I would argue that there is a case for an overlay of still thinking about risk stratification and ongoing surveillance. But let's be clear, we don't know the long-term effects of vaccines we just got. We don't, right? I mean, you wanna know, is it possible that years after getting this vaccine, your eyeballs will suddenly catch fire? Sure, it's possible. We, we don't have years worth of surveillance. But let's be equally honest with one another. We don't have years worth of follow-up for SARS-CoV-2 either. Maybe years after getting the virus, your eyeballs will suddenly catch fire, right? So you know, what's good for the goose needs to be good for the gander here. So what we ought to do is risk stratify, allocate the, the vaccine where it is most likely to do the most good because it is very probable to be much lower risk than exposure to the virus. And then we should monitor very carefully and adjust accordingly. And before we migrate the vaccine into low risk populations, we need a substantially greater degree of confidence that even in them, the risks of vaccination are substantially lower than the risk of the infection. Again, for kids that would set the bar pretty high because SARS-CoV-2 is a very low risk exposure for kids. So I think that kind of thinking mark can inform our policy. And I hope, you know, I guess, you know, the, the, the the proof of this will be in the, in the commentary you get, you know, whether, whether people are saying thanks for bringing cats or, or they're <laughs> hurling things at my head. Um, you know, I, I think this is an argument that ideally can reach everybody. You know, it, it, it's not the claim that, that vaccines are our salvation and, you know, we don't need to hear the hallelujah chorus when we're told a vaccine's available, um, but we shouldn't renounce the likely benefit if we use vaccines well. Uh, and, and in my case, by the way, and, and I'm really, as I say, not terribly sick, never in any danger, but not enjoying COVID. You know, I, I'm not enjoying it at all. Um, this is longer than I've been sick with anything um, pretty much in my life. My energy's still not back to normal. I still have bad headaches. And my olfaction, which disappeared completely, is back you know, maybe about 10%. And, you know, I'm an enophile, I like a good glass of wine it really ruins that experience if you can't smell. So, you know, I'm eager for that to come back. Um, and, you know, the recommendation is one dose of the vaccine is a booster following infection. Uh, and I, I likely will do that. Um, you know, looking at the evidence, I'll watch the evidence that comes in between now and, you know, when I get to the front of the line, um, but I'll likely do that. And, you know, just to be uh, clear about the fact that I, I put my practices where my policies are, uh, my parents are both 81 years old. Uh, my dad's a physician. He's still seeing patients. Uh, my mom is just 81 years old, but they've both been vaccinated. You know, we talked about it and it absolutely makes sense. You know, that they, they really can't afford to get this bug uh, because of their age. And, you know, unlike these other risk factors, you, you know, if you're an octogenarian, you're an octogenarian. <laughs> That's not modifiable. So, so again, um, I think we can do both. I think we can make optimal use of the advent of vaccines in record time and superimpose on our policy uh, a risk stratified approach. And that can be used both to distribute the vaccines to do optimal good, but also to guide thinking. You know, let, let's move down the risk tiers and monitor very carefully. So, you know, basically, we're exposing populations to the vaccine that we already know can't afford to be exposed to the bug and holding off on exposing populations like kids that actually do quite well with the bug and making sure we have enough data to be nearly certain that the benefit of vaccination in that population outweighs any risk. And that's when we should proceed. All right. Thank you very much, David. Really enjoyed your, uh, your time with us today. I really appreciate you coming along as well, uh, as I'm sure everybody else does. Um, Pleasure to be with you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk later. All right. Um, so we have finished just on time to go to the next person. It's someone um, that uh, many people that are listening in uh, have been keen to hear again, Byron Bridal, who was uh, with us um, last time in our last presentation. Uh, he's a viral immunologist from the University of Guelph in Canada. 